Despite its critics, globalization has increased prosperity around the globe. Yet billions remain in poverty. Two-thirds of the world's population, four billion people, are locked out of the capitalist system. They're living like this right now. They're frustrated. It's important to let them in. Millions of people are living longer and better lives today than their grandparents ever dreamed. In the short term, their fortunes will rise and fall with the markets. But long term, their inevitable march toward a better life is undeniable. Poor people are migrating to the world cities in astounding numbers, embracing globalization despite the risks. And when the laws they encounter don't work for them, they create their own. And yet today, the poor are still locked out of the system. Globalization is a civilization in the making. Civilization has always been designed by elites. And the tendency of elites has always been to feel that if it just covers themselves and maybe the top 10 or 20 percent, it's all right. If globalization doesn't create the space required for those who are excluded to come in, does not give them the instruments, the tools with which to prosper, they will be left out as orphans, and these orphans will end up bringing civilization down. Hernando de Soto is an award-winning author and economist. He is an advocate for the economic potential of the poor to lift their countries out of poverty. His life has become a quest to understand the roots of poverty and to do something about it. If we want to make globalization available to everyone, we have to understand what it is. One can have an image of globalization being, for example, a ship with containers full of apples coming in from the United States to China. But if we look at the apples inside that container, there's nothing in those apples that say who owns it. A stolen apple looks exactly like an apple that I own. There's nothing in the apple that tells you that this apple is mine, that it can be sold, that it can be bought, that it can be rented, that it can be leased, that it can be mortgaged, that it can serve as a guarantee. About a hundred operations that you can do with an apple to globalize it are not contained in the apple. What gives the apple its global attributes is the law. It is the law that says what it is that the apple can do and how it can be transferred. In other words, globalization is not about apples. We've always had apples. Globalization is about the relationships we can create between ourselves to have large amounts of apple go from one place to another with a scale such that productivity, that benefits for everybody, will go up. Globalization is essentially the product of the rule of law. And it's a rule of law that is really only accessible to one third of the world's population. The impact of a population locked out of capitalism and globalization is clearly visible in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Hernando de Soto and his team have been at work in this poor sub-Saharan country for over three years to find out if the absence of private property rights and inclusive business law are at the root of Africa's poverty. I think poverty is a terrible thing. It makes for suffering, it makes for sickness, it makes for short lives. It destructs society, it makes thieves out of people, it corrupts people. I want prosperity. And yet, Africa and poverty have long been synonymous. 33 of the poorest countries on earth are in Africa. Now, why is that? Are they being exploited by the West? Is it ethnic? Is it cultural? Is it colonialism? Is it imperialism? Capitalist exploitation? Is it corruption? Dependency politics? The climate? Is it the food? Why can't they be as prosperous as the people from the North? 
Some sociologists suggest that Africans are culturally different from Western entrepreneurs. Before coming to Africa, the question was, is the predominant way of organizing oneself socially the tribal way, the communal way? Is the notion of property rights, of business exercised by individuals, or voluntary groups that get together, an imposition on the Africans, or could it be part of their nature? Looking for an answer, researchers crisscrossed Tanzania seeking data. What they found was remarkable. 89% of all territory and most business in the country is controlled by private businesses. Small ones, made up of poor people, but private nevertheless. Only 11% is controlled by tribal authorities. In fact, Africans have been in the business of trading with each other throughout history. But today, most are locked out of the globalized world. Are Africans entrepreneurial? Look around you. Any place you go in Africa, you will see people getting organized working. Here, for example, we are in an area where different people have gotten together, so they each make a different part of furniture that is then brought together and displayed. Do each of you specialize? How do you make this bed? The people who make this are different from the people who make this, and the people who do this are different. Different. So all the spirit of entrepreneurship is here in Africa. What's missing are the legal institutions with which people can be brought together and become a lot more productive and wealthy. The small, elite, formal sector has a unified legal system that connects them to the globalized world. Hernando de Soto and his team have found that 89% of all properties in Tanzania are held extra-legally and 98% of all businesses operate informally or outside the law. They remain disconnected from globalization. What there is in Africa are pieces of law. It's like a mosaic. So it's a lot of little laws that have to be brought into one so that all Africans can understand each other and then understand each other with the rest of the world. That's called globalization. There is a growing feeling in many parts of the world that capitalism or globalization has failed people. But that's not really a correct statement because in most of the world what you've got is pre-capitalism or what I like to call mercantilism, which was the initial stage of capitalism in Western countries where only a few people had access to the tools of creating wealth. Some people like to call it crony capitalism. The important thing is this. Capitalism as a system is not yet functioning in most of the world. And the blame on capitalism is for the lack of it rather than because it's there. Although capitalism is working in the developed world, developing countries still lack its basic tools. To the farmers of the high Andes, raising livestock has been a way of life for centuries. Eleuterio Fuyo Tiniente, his daughter Juliana, his son Edson, and his wife Ana Jesusa live in a simple adobe house in the tiny village of Inquilpata, Peru. They own nine head of cattle, raise pigs and ducks, grow corn and potatoes, and produce just enough milk for their family. Today, they'll take four cows to the weekly livestock market and offer them for sale. Cows or livestock are a great asset for humble people all throughout the history of the world. They present a mobile way to keep capital. Capital is often associated with money spent or invested by capitalists. But in fact, the root word of capital comes from the Latin word caput, meaning head. Which is one of the reasons why many people say that the word capital basically came from heads of cows. De Soto has another idea about the source of the word capital. Capital comes from capita, head, but in the sense that it's a concept that because it is a concept can only be captured in the head. In other words, capital doesn't exist in things. 
It is the potential of things that we can see once they are described in a certain organized way on a property document. Cattle without titles are regularly sold at this market, but at a lower price than documented animals. Without a piece of paper, it loses a lot of its exchange value in the broader market where it can fetch higher prices for whoever owns it. The same is true of a person's most important asset, their house. <laughs> On the outskirts of a village in rural Tanzania, Saloum Saif Makani Diga owns his home. It's his major asset and he paid for it with cash. This small house shelters him and 13 other family members. It has five rooms, no kitchen, and an outdoor latrine. Saloum and his wife Amina live on less than $2 a day. A house in a developing country is a shelter which cannot be mortgaged, which cannot be used as a reference, which doesn't have an address so it cannot be easily located. In the developing world, Houses are places where people live, period. That's it. But in the West, things are different. So this is it here. It's on yeah. a 55 foot wide lot, which is pretty unusual for this part of town. Actually, a house is more than just a home in developed countries. It's a capitalist tool. Robert Paris is a successful realtor in the northern suburbs of Chicago. He and his buyers and sellers operate within a comprehensive legal system of property rights. In the West, every building has a virtual counterpart that exists in documents and databases. This enables buyers to know the actual sale prices of comparable nearby homes, and if there are any liens or other legal issues connected to the house. People can learn more from good documents and databases about a house than they can by walking through the house. In the West, it's easier to determine the true value of a house, and that helps give the buyers and sellers confidence. Houses are often the main way people grow their equity. They can be used as collateral, and they can be more easily bought and sold. In the developing world, a home is still its owner's major asset, but the value of the house without proper title is locked up, unavailable. Capitalism, globalization, and free markets are all about trading property rights. Nowhere is this more apparent than in the global commodities markets. And there is no better example than the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. My name is Mike Quattrocchi. I'm a floor trader at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange in the live cattle options and futures pit. I buy and sell futures contracts based on the live cattle contract. All day long, Quattrocchi trades cattle by the thousands. Your adrenaline is going very fast. You're asked to do complicated math quickly in a very, very split-second maneuver. There's lots of pushing, lots of shoving. Today, Mike Quattrocchi works the floor, although 80% of futures trades at the Chicago Merck are conducted online. When you look at the big markets of the West, you see people dealing in symbols all they deal with are representations of value. What I'm trading today is, is roughly 1,000 futures contracts. That represents about 40,000 head of cattle. There's no physical way that we could ever transact that if we actually had to go out to a farm or a ranch and round up the cattle and buy and sell them with each other. I never see this cattle. I actually have never been outside of Chicago to the west to see where these animals are. In the United States and Western Europe, your documents go to the market and practically work for you and think for you. In the developing countries and most of the former Soviet Union, the majority of people actually have to bring their animals to market. It's a cash market. It is late in the afternoon when El Uterio finds a potential buyer. If he is interested in making an offer, he'll hand over hard currency. The first offer is always low. All over the market, cash money is changing hands. It's counted, often rejected and returned. El Uterio's buyer is willing to pay more, and so a deal is struck. People in the developing world have cattle, 
land and houses the same way they do in the Western world. What is missing is the rule of law, and principally within the rule of law, the property rights systems that allow identities, that allow risks, and that allow potential to be revealed. Globalization is about relationships. And relationships as opposed to apples are not tangible. They're not something that you can physically seize, that are distinguishable visually. Relationships are abstract, but they're very important. A kiss can lead to a marriage. A punch can lead to a war. A handshake can lead to peace. These are all relationships, and they're extremely important. So we've got a world that is composed basically of two things, hard things and soft things. The soft things are the law that actually guide our relationships. And if you work within a parochial community and you only deal with people you know, you don't need the law because you've got custom. But the moment you leave your village and you start going global, you need the law. And what we're saying is that two-thirds of the population don't have the rule of law and the tools it brings into our hands to create what we call today globalization.